What's up and welcome everybody to Falcon's Final Whistle, your preeminent and authoritative post-game podcast from the people at AtlantaFalcons.com. I'm your host, Digital Managing Editor Scott Baer, and with me is AtlantaFalcons.com beat reporter and football analyst Tori McElhaney. Say hi, Tori. Hello, hello. And we have long-form features reporter Chris Rim also in the room. Say what's up, Chris. What's up? And we are going to break down Sunday afternoon's 32-6 to loss to the Philadelphia Eagles, which happened right here at Mercedes-Benz Stadium, where we still are a full seven hours after this game is over. Yes. And we're going to try to break this game down, tell you what this game was, what it meant, and how it's going to fall into place into the big picture of the 2021 Falcon season. And we're going to do this after every single game, rain or shine, win or loss. And we're going to do this in a fun and kind of structured way. We're going to go over four quarters, five minutes per quarter, not the standard 15, five minutes per quarter, and we're going to make fun of each other. We're going to debate things. We're going to disagree, although I will always be right. And uh, we're going to come to conclusions about where this Falcons team stands. So please feel free to uh, give us a rating, a review, subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you can get audio, you will find this podcast. And uh, hopefully you, uh, you like what you hear more than you like what you saw from the Falcons over the course of this game where they didn't do a lot of things right. Tori, what was your biggest takeaway from what was a disappointing start to the Arthur Smith and Terry Fontenot era? of the Atlanta Falcons. First of all, that was an amazing transition. So kudos no, to No, I was for thinking that. the same thing. Right? I was like, that, that, was was a, that was a great transition. Yeah. That was super smooth. We point love for that. me. <laughs> we're not really keeping score, but now we are because <laughs> I, I have the first point. Oh, man. Okay, no, but on a serious note, I think I was so looking forward to finally getting to this point because I feel like all we've been doing over the last nine months since Arthur Smith and Terry Fontenot got in here was like just speculation. We're just speculating as to what this team was going to do, what this team was going to to look like and you know I was really excited for this game because I was finally like oh my gosh we're finally going to get to see what this group looks like but even now that the game is over I feel like I still don't really have that answer I feel like there's a lot of questions that I still have for this team um, in terms of just my overall thoughts my biggest takeaway had to be the offensive lines I guess lack of production that to me I, I went into this game thinking that was going to be the key to the game I, I even said so many times I was like the Falcons overall success hinges on the productivity of this offensive line and I think now that we look back on the game whether it was penalties or, or whatever it was pass protection it was just I wanted more from that group and and maybe I expected two more going into it but that that was just my biggest takeaway because that was something that I was thinking about the entire week leading up to this game. Chris, what are your thoughts after this game where not a lot went right? Uh, what did you kind of take away from it, positives, negatives, uh, from your end? I mean, what did go right at the beginning was the running game, and that was really my biggest takeaway was how it went right until it didn't, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, which was early. Uh, you know, Cordero Patterson looked great. His first runs were like combined for 25 yards, and Mike Davis broke out, you know, a 12-yard run on second, second, you know, possession. So I thought – Things were going well for the running game. I, you know, Twitter people were excited about the running game, and then it just came to a fiery halt. And, you know, once you they got down, it's hard to continue to run the ball. So I thought the positives from that is, you know, look, the running game looked a lot better than it has in, in recent years. But at the same time, it looked like it has in recent years for the long, <laughs> the <laughs> like, half, for the yeah. most, for the largest part of the game. So, you know, Matt Ryan talked about it post game, and Jalen Mayfield talked a little bit about it. So, I think that's one thing for Falcon fans to look at. I think from this game to say, okay, we we looked good for about a quarter. Moving forward, how can we replicate that quarter? Mm. Yeah, and I, I really think that with this Falcons team as it's currently constructed. There's no secret that it's thin, right? They, they just don't have a lot of depth. And they're one of those teams where everything needs to go right for this team to be consistently competitive and to stay close in games. And that's not what happened. Too many things went wrong. And we're going to break them all down here over the course of the next four quarters. There will be no points assigned, I don't think, unless they fall in my favor. But nonetheless, we are marching on with Falcons' final whistle. Let's get to it, the first quarter. We have five minutes to talk about the most important thing in my mind that happened after 
this Falcons-Eagles game, and that was head coach Arthur Smith, who never makes an opening statement before his press conference. He started it off like this, and I quote, I did a really poor job of getting us ready to go. I feel awful for our fans and everybody who showed up today. We'll do a better job moving forward. That game is not going to define us. It's a long season to go, but I didn't do a good job of getting us ready to go. Now, we've heard coaches fall on their sword before, but what, Tori, you can go first. What do you think this particular statement meant for this particular game? Did it surprise you at all that he opened the presser the, that way? I think it falls right in line with something that we've heard about Arthur Smith since he took this job, and it was something that I wrote about post game. you know, so, <laughs> plug for the old work. <laughs> um, but anyways, I, I think we have heard so much about Arthur Smith's accountability, and I think he almost to a certain extent was holding himself accountable I don't know what goes on, you know, behind closed doors and anything and what he was talking about in terms of, like, the the penalties, some of those penalties in terms of you know, illegal formations and false starts. He was like, that's on me. That I, I put that on me, and I think that is an accountability of sorts where he's like, I need to get these guys prepared to play in terms of talking about those penalties. That's the way that I took it, and, and that was the way that I thought – that he was going with it, especially when we got really into the press conference and he brought it up. Uh, so, so to me, that's kind of where my mind is at, where it was him kind of showcasing that accountability that he has not only for these players, but the accountability that he has for himself. And I think he has a really good opportunity ahead to kind of be like, all right, we're putting this into practice. We've talked about it. We've talked about it. Let's actually go out and do it. And it's, it's going to be really easy just to pull the first part of that quote out and make a mountain out of a molehill and just say, Arthur Smith, colon, I did a really poor job getting us ready to go. Right. Let's talk about it. Um, but nonetheless, Chris, let's just ask that question. Did he do a poor job of, of getting this team ready to go? And was that evident in these in these pre-snap penalties? Or do you think that, that, uh, that that's an over-exaggeration here, that maybe there's more blame to get kicked around? Yeah, yeah, I think there's obviously more more blame to get get kicked around than just that. I think, and I don't think it was it was all on him. I kind of, I mean, I like when people do that, but it's also kind of like you know when the one person tries to take the blame for everything. Everyone knows it's not just you who who you know made the team lose like this. So I think it was a it was good for him to say. But I thought the weirdest thing about that press conference is just that. You know, he's talking and he's saying all this while his bosses are like in the corner, <laughs> right? Like Terry Fontenot oh, yeah. and Arthur Blank are just sitting there looking at him while he says all of this. So I wonder how he feels when he's saying this. But yeah, I think there are some challenges on on the offensive line. The Philly defensive line was physical, dominant. He can't go out there and block himself. Mm -hmm. um, he can't go out there and play defensive back himself. You know, we don't obviously we we don't know like Tory said what's going on behind closed doors, what the directions are, what he's telling the team, what they're going through. But yeah, I think for example, like I, I was, I was confused at least that in the two times that they went to the red zone that Kyle Pitts wasn't on the field. Right. That that's something that I think I wish he, he I would have got a chance to ask a question that he could have talked about because of his dominance in the red zone in college. I think that's one thing I think about that maybe, maybe was a mistake for him or maybe that was a strategy that he was using. He thought someone else was better suited for that. But that that's one thing that I could think of. But but no way is the blame o solely on Arthur Smith. Yeah, and I look at it, and I don't think Arthur Smith wanted to start Jalen Mayfield at left guard against oh, no. Fletcher right. Cox. He said right? the other day that that was the contingency plan. Right. Like He was like, you make contingency plans. This was a contingency plan. Josh Andrews was supposed to be the starting left right. guard. And if you that take he was away – get baptized. <laughs> right, and, and that's exactly what, 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 what happened for a third-round pick who yeah. got thrown into the fire in right. a very difficult position. I thought it was pretty uh, respectable – that uh, that that he was able to that Jalen went in front of the press and was yeah. accountable for it. That's pretty strange for somebody so young. Also, that's tough. Like there were some pictures that I saw of him on the sideline looking like a sad puppy, and I was just like, dear God! Like I think we're forgetting how little, uh, I guess, just time he has spent at left guard, especially right. going right. up against this type of competition. Not to make excuses or anything like that, but. At the end of the day, he has a third-round pick who wasn't supposed to be starting today. And who was playing outside of his position against one of the best yep. defensive lines in the NFL. So, Yeah, so, I mean, I really think uh, plenty of blame to go around for this one. Head coach, players, uh, you name it, as we run out of time on the first quarter. 
Topic number two for our next five-minute segment comes down to the amount of yellow we saw on the field. There was a lot of it for both teams, and the Falcons really hurt themselves time and again to the tune of 12 penalties for 99 yards. And here's the kicker. Here's what Arthur Smith was really upset about. We talked about it a bit in the previous segment, but five pre-snap penalties, three false starts from the left guard position alone, and then... Kyle Smith <laughs> lining up over another tight end, illegal formation from the two. Those are things that get you pointed out during the film session. Those are things that will get you beat when, like when you're thin. Were those penalties insurmountable, right? I mean, like, could they have overcome that? Or do you think that was the primary reason that set this team back during this game? Well, I mean, I think they could have been uh – surmountable is that a word no maybe but it is now but we now we all know what I'm talking about (laughs) but my thing is is like okay Philly also didn't play very clean they had a ton of penalties as well so I don't necessarily even though there was a ton of penalties 99 yards that's going to be awful every single time I don't 100% just put it on the penalties. You have to go down. I put it down, you know, third downs, red zone. I mean, all of these things where they weren't getting the job done in a lot of other areas, I think it just makes the penalties that much more uh, important in terms of the overall scope of the game. It's like, well, you were penalized for 99 yards. Like, what did you expect was going to happen? And and, and so I think that that to me is where it's like, I think they could have been – overlooked if they were actually converting on the field on offense that I mean that's just me yeah I mean the 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 Eagles were penalized 14 times for 89 yards but they had 434 total yards of of offense and the Falcons only had 260 so you're you're taking 260 going forward and you're going backwards 99 I mean I'm no that's a huge difference math yeah. guy yeah I'm yeah. not but either that ain't I good. don't I w- yeah. that's why I got into journalism I don't like writing <laughs> I, I don't like math. wait a minute right. I Hold do on. like I do like writing <laughs> I I will go on the record to say I do like writing and I hate math okay and but so it, at least we got that straight and we definitely got <laughs> it, it it's straight here that there were too many penalties too often yeah. Um, do you and think timely penalties? Right, that was right. another thing. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say too. I think it matters where you're penalized. Oh, at. Like yeah. when you, the one you mentioned about Kyle Pitts lining up over Lee Smith at the, at the two. I think that's a challenging. I think that's a tough one. Like the, yeah. the like where it happens at. But also like you were saying, three for fourteen on third down. On third down, the Eagles were six for thirteen. Like it, you have to maximize your other opportunities when you when you need them. So mm-hmm. once you say that you were penalized that many times, it's just like adding salt to the wound on top of you not being effective when you needed to be. Yeah, and I, I, you look at some of the other ones that they had. And this podcast isn't designed to uh, to litigate whether Eric Harris should have gotten that that personal foul. But you look at two offensive pass interference penalties on picks, like things that it just wasn't executed well. And I think too often things weren't executed well. It's a byproduct of those types of things. But let's not forget that going back even to the offseason program, every time you false started in in practice, you ran a lap. Didn't matter if you were Jake Matthews or Jalen Mayfield or or, or Kyle Pitts. Yeah. (laughs) So I don't think it's a matter of Arthur Smith not putting importance behind it. I think more than anything else, it's a matter of a young team, a new team, maybe some emotions got the best of them. But we're saying maybe, maybe, maybe. But these are the types of things that cannot continue for the Falcons to be competitive in these games. It's crazy. Like, you go back and you think, I thought, I'll, like, I'll take the blame here. I thought that Philly was a very winnable game. I thought they yeah. were I thought they were a team that could be taken advantage of at home in Arthur Smith's first game. That, that, that defensive line put – Chris, do you think that that was a, a factor as we have about 45 seconds here? Uh, do you think that was a factor as you have the offensive line making pre-snap penalties? You got Fletcher Cox breathing and, and Brandon <laughs> Gam breathing down your neck yeah. before every play. Yeah, well, do you think Jay- Philly had an influence there? Yeah, well, Jalen Mayfield, I don't know if you saw Jalen Mayfield's false start was the first time uh, Fletcher was lined up in front of him. Really? Yeah, he, he, he tried to jump the snap. Because he, <laughs> he was thinking, he's probably thinking, I mean, it, I, I don't know, I'll probably do the same thing if I was down there. And, but, yeah, I think – you think when when Jalen said 
post game, like we, we were trying to play physical because we knew how they were going to be. Or, you know, sometimes when you think too much about who you're going to play against, sometimes it affects what you do when you get too nervous. First game jitters, no offensive line. So, yeah, I think defensive line, their presence had a little bit of an effect. Yeah, and it's all a negative effect. Things they got to clean up as we move on. In our third quarter, we have five minutes to break down exactly where the running game went, right? <laughs> because because it. it was right there in plain view in the first quarter. Yeah. What what an amazing first quarter of not only good running by Mike Davison and Cordero Patterson, but excellent play design by head coach Arthur yeah. Smith. Things were working well. They were able to move the ball downfield. There was space, right? But this is one of those things where it's week one, and then you get some adjustments on both sides, and – Bottom line, they had more yards in the first quarter than they had at seven in seven individual games last season. And then the rest of the game didn't go quite so well. So, open-ended, where did the running game go? Where'd it go? Chris, you go because you wrote about this. I have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> and that's on that. <laughs> <laughs> nah, but uh, yeah, I did write about this. Like, myself was plugged, like, Tories for Fal- <laughs> AlenaFalcons.com. But, but to be honest, I, I think – like you said, it's got adjustments. Uh, the defensive line seemed to be getting through with ease. Um, it seemed like before it was like more like there was like there was a space. Like the first two drives, there was a space uh, from passes to to and and it was it was precise the way they were they were moving the ball, both running and passing. And then once they got down a little bit, they just started pinning their ears back and coming for Matt, <laughs> and the running game was gone. Fearing, fearing for uh, Matt Ryan's safety. For yeah, a in, the, bit in the third quarter they had negative two yards rushing. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, I don't. I, I that's like a, it's a huge disappearing act. I mean, and and obviously once you go down, but but you would think once you're down, if you if you run, you would be able to gain you know a little bit. But yeah, I don't. I, I'm sorry, that's not the best answer, but uh, I don't know. We we don't know. And that, <laughs> I will say it was very encouraging to see that, especially coming from what I saw in the run game last year right. and how just abysmal it was at times. How we we say like where is the running game? Like I felt like I questioned that almost every single play last year. I mean, it really did feel that way. I said I wrote all the time. I was like the Falcons feel too one dimensional, um, but. Even in saying that, I felt like it was encouraging this first half, but I think Matt Ryan said it best when he was talking post game about how they just really it, the it, the like wheels fell off the wagon in the second half and they weren't getting the push that they needed to on first and second down, which is making it hard on them on third down. And that is exactly what we have talked about over the last year of being a problem for this team. So for me, when I'm looking at the run game, it's like you did it in the first half. And even Arthur Smith said that they didn't really change anything. They be, being the Eagles. So, what what's the disconnect between what we saw in that first half and, and the second half? I mean, do either of y'all have any clarity? Because I I don't. I, I, I feel like I am just kind of grasping at straws. Like, why couldn't you give it back to CP? He was doing so well. I yeah. don't understand. Yeah, I, I think the Eagles defensive line eventually took this game over yeah. Yeah. a little bit, and they started asserting their will, especially on the inside, which – if you can't run inside, it's hard to run anywhere. But I, I look at it how they had, what, five consecutive drives that ended with a punt, mm-hmm. something like that. Yeah. And it and it's so coach speak to say they weren't on schedule. They were behind the sticks. But, like, when you add – so, like, okay, so, like, maybe penalties aren't all to blame for everything bad that happened. Maybe the di- disappearing act of the run game isn't bad for everything – isn't to blame for everything that happened. But – when all those things add together and you put yourself in a bad spot and I'm just going to throw this in there. This isn't on topic, but whatever. When they gave up that two point conversion after the penalty on the PAT and then they, the Eagles went up two scores into the second half. It's, it's one point. It's one penalty. I thought that was a huge deal that, that took the Falcons kind of out of what they wanted to do in, in the first quarter I think a, like a lot of that's scripted, a lot of that's planned, and you can see inside of Arthur Smith's mind, and wow, that's really impressive, right? But them having to get away from that, they didn't have any real responses. And I'm not necessarily saying that's a lack of adjustment on the coach's part. I think they just got out physical mm. uh, up front, and that really slowed them down. But, you know, more of more of Cordero Patterson. We have about 30 seconds left, Tori. Cordero Patterson was impressive when he yeah. had the opportunity 
do you think he's earned more carries, or do you think he's going to have kind of like a set role uh, yes, moving he's forward? Earned, yes, he's earned more carries in my eyes. I mean, I think I I think he should be getting the ball as much as Mike Davis at this point, and that is not something that I came into this season thinking. So he <laughs> really, <no>. truly <laughs> did impress me coming into – the, it, it, just ending this game, I am very impressed with Cordero Patterson. Whew, just under the <laughs> wire. I, I saw that thing going to five minutes. I know, I didn't it, know. It was very close. And for our final segment, we're going to be looking forward to next week when the Atlanta Falcons have a super easy job ahead going on the road <laughs> against the Super Bowl champs and the greatest quarterback of all time. Bum, bum, bum. Walk in the park. Uh, nonetheless, this is going to be a very difficult uh, game to respond to, to what happened here. But broad question, Tori McElhaney wrote it. It was a good one. So uh, what needs to be fixed before they face Tampa? Mm -hmm. What is essential in terms of improvement before they go farther south and play Tom Brady? It needs to just be a cleaner operation as a whole. Like, I'm talking penalties. I'm talking ball movement. I'm talking, you know, consistently being effective in the run game for four quarters. Like, all these things seem really simple in the grand scheme of things, but we didn't see them do that against Philly. <laughs> if they couldn't do it against Philly, how are they going to be able to do it against Tampa, who I would argue is a much better team? Um, I think a lot of people would argue that they're a much better team. Uh, so being able to play efficiently, cleanly, I mean, I don't, I don't think the Falcons would go down and just like absolutely murder Tampa or anything like that. But being able to just play a clean game at this point after what we just saw, I think is a step up from, from what we, we did just see against Philly. Yeah, um, I think – Agreed. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, but I sweet. think O-line, they might need to see what it's looking like out there um, to see if they need to make – if they could possibly oh, yeah. make – It's like, is there a veteran left guard yeah, anywhere? Something. <laughs> so I'm, I don't – because I don't know – yeah, because I don't know how that's – the way they fared against Philly tonight, I think the Buccaneers is kind of going to be the same situation. Yeah. But also I think defensively – now, the Bucks are obviously different in terms of Brady just sits there, and I thought what hurt the Falcons today was Hurts' mobility because stuff was kind of covered. But you're playing against a team that has three wide receiver ones, essentially, and Gronk and Fournette and just a, a boatload of weapons, a bevy of weapons. And today, Philly just scored 32 points today mm -hmm. and only allowed six points. This is the Eagles and you're, you're playing the Super Bowl champ. So I think they, they need to just reevaluate and just forget about this game and reevaluate, you know, defensively making sure everything is <laughs> everything is correct <laughs> from the secondary and also looking – I think really think the, the offensive line because I think going into the season we kind of expected, like, the Falcons would score points. I don't think any – I don't think people thought that the Falcons would put up six against Philly. So I yeah. think if they can try to score with teams and hopefully slow teams, slow teams down – I think that's the goal for next week. So I, I would say priority number one is, is figuring out the O-line because Matt Ryan can't be back there fighting for his life every right. week. I think you make a good point, too, about, like, we thought that the Falcons would be able to score. Like, yeah. I remember saying multiple times during the preseason, like, don't worry, they're not scoring because it's, like, not the starting offense. Right. Well, the starting offense didn't score anything tonight. Yeah. Like so, I, not to cut you off, but no, I, think, I think the Cowboys and the Bucks game, mm. I feel like that – I see the – I see the – Buccaneers offense similarly to how I, the Buccaneers, the Falcons offense similarly to how I look at the, the I, I see the the Falcons similarly to how I look at the Cowboys to be honest. Right. Whereas like the offense is really really strong, um, they have good wide receivers. I, th I see the Falcons the same way. The offense is really really strong and the defense is on its way. Right. And so the the game will be high scoring. We're trying to outscore each other. You know, uh, 32, 29, or twenty. Like a what track me. Yeah, yeah, it's a track me. Yeah. So that that's that's how I expect that game to turn out. And I think. If they can do that and, and figure out the – just give Matt Ryan some time, yeah. he'll be fine because I think it's hard for you to make plays when you're fighting for your life. Well, it was like one time I, like, tried to time it in my head, and I was like, that has to be less than two seconds in the pocket yeah. that he had, yeah. like, easily. And any quarterback who, who is not – like, if Tom Brady was in that situation, it would I think it would be the same result in terms of the time that you're given right. when you're a non-mobile quarterback. Right. You know what I mean? You need that time. Not yeah. not saying you need all day, but you need a second <laughs> to you go through your progression. Than, yeah, you need more than two seconds. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and it, it just to on, on the defensive side – of the ball with, with with these guys that don't leave the pocket very often and have they get rid of the ball quick. You have to get into the backfield quickly, and a lot of that is I always say is interior 
pressure. I want to see more from Marlon Davidson in terms of snaps, in terms of activity. Grady Jarrett was Grady Jarrett. I, I didn't feel Dante Fowler very much. I, I didn't feel anybody off of the edge, but you've got to be able to, to penetrate and disrupt. He's not going to make many errors. He will make zero if he has time back there with all right. those wideouts, Chris, uh, as you mentioned. So I uh, I think that they need improvement on both sides of the ball just to be able to to take that step forward. It starts with clean operation, and it goes into better execution. I, I think that's the only way it's going to make it work. Whew, we just made it right under the wire, five minutes almost on the dot there, and that's <laughs> going to bring uh, the first ever Falcons final whistle to a close. Chris, Tori, thank you guys so much for sticking with us uh, well into the night. They were nice enough to leave a couple of lights on for us. I know. Us. I think we should tell people that they legit were turning off lights. Like, we're in a booth at the stadium, and they were going down turning off the lights, and ours is the only one still on. But we are still here for you. <laughs> <laughs> Go check out AtlantaFalcons.com. There's plenty of good stories on there. The best one written by me, naturally. And uh, <laughs> Point two. <laughs> I can't even keep a straight face when I say that that nonetheless subscribe on apple Podcasts, itunes that's the same thing spotify everywhere that you can get a podcast hit subscribe rate All review that. let's get uh let's let uh, let's get some feedback let's get some topics let's get some uh, yeah. a engagement going uh as we move forward let's talk about what you want to hear about that's our goal as we try to take a macro and a micro view of this atlanta falcons game by game and uh, and about the season as a whole so chris tory thank you so much everybody thank you so much for joining in and listening we'll talk to you again next sunday